a device uh, for uh, minimally invasive treatment of BPH or Olympus. My name is Vanessa Malka. I'm the Executive Director for Commercial Light in Olympus. And I'm here today with uh, a San Antonio local. <coughs> uh, my, hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to San Antonio. My name is Naveen Kella. I'm a urologist. I've been here since 2005 uh, and have uh, Good bit of experience with uh, the ITIN device and uh, with other BPH modalities. So thank you for uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Kella. Dr. Kella was actually one of the first commercial users of ITIN uh, in the U.S., so we're really happy to have him with us today. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it's no secret to anyone that BPH is one of the most common diseases of the aging male. Most men will experience uh, some kind of symptoms of BPH in their lifetime if they're lucky to live long enough. <clears throat> uh, and because of that, there is a wide range of treatments, very effective treatments for BPH on the market, from drug therapy to surgeries. But despite that fact, uh, the majority of BPH sufferers today are still left untreated. Um, so Dr. Kella, I know that you have a very busy BPH practice. Do these statistics resonate with you? Is this reflect what you see in your practice? They do. I mean, we most. I mean, as most of you, uh, I'm assuming have similar uh, referral patterns. A lot of our patients uh, come in uh, when the primary care has seen them, and they're starting to fail medical management. But we also have a fair amount in today's environment. They look at the website, they do reviews, and they say they go straight to the urologist. And so we actually have some patients who have never been on medications either. Uh, but a lot of them are reluctant to pursue therapy because they're worried about side effects. They remember what happened to their dad, you know, uh, they've heard about the, the catheter or the bleeding. And so a lot of times they'd rather be just leave it alone or get on a uh, lifetime of medications, which then, you know, a lot of times can have side effects that lead to a lot of patients discontinuing therapy. And so the patients just continue to suffer really in, in, in science. So it's like our opportunity to get in there and do something and to have things that are less invasive are very helpful. So really when we uh, went about to develop uh, the ITIN procedure for BPH many years ago, one of the things that we really had in mind is uh, we were trying to find a way to address this huge unmet uh, uh, patient population. And we understood that if we were to address that unmet uh, patient population, First of all, the device would have to be effective, but it would have to be able to address their concerns. So as Dr. Kello was saying, the concerns of side effects that are associated with drug therapy, um, and also of the risk of adverse events uh, that are sometimes seen with uh, more invasive surgeries or even minimally invasive surgeries. Um, so Dr. Kello, I know that you offer a wide range of BPH treatments from minimally invasive uh, to more invasive treatments. And where do you see ITIN fitting in alongside all of those other treatment modalities? So ITIN is you know, definitely one of the minimally invasive, most minimally invasive procedures we can offer right now. Uh, it's a procedure that's great for men who uh, are very interested in maintaining their sexual function. Not, not just talking about erectile function, but their ejaculatory function. Uh, it's something that in the past we never would even bring up, but now uh, I think with the internet and just patients being more aware, one of the first questions they seem to ask is, well, what's going to happen with my ejaculatory function? And so we have, you know, I've offered procedures uh, such as Resume in the office, Aerolift, um, ITIN uh, now, and they all have a, a, a fairly good side effect profile, but it's nice to be able to offer something uh, where ITIN, for example, would be great for a patient uh, who doesn't want anything left in their body, uh, who uh, is absolutely you know, he's adamant about not having any impact on their sexual function nor their ejaculation. So it's assumed that kind of positioning uh, in the practice um, and it, uh, you know, the potential help that it can give really without these side effects resonates. Thank you. Um, so, so again, uh, as we uh, were working on the development of the ITIN, we were really looking to uh, provide a treatment option uh, for patients that would be catheter-free, that would be effective, that would, uh, that would offer significant and durable symptomatic relief, but without a lot of the adverse events uh, that you see from other treatment modalities. So for those of you that aren't familiar, <clears throat> the ITIN is a temporarily implanted nitinol device. Uh, it comes pre-mounted on a dedicated delivery system in a current configuration. It's comprised of three incisional struts at 12, 5, and 7 o'clock. 
uh, it's implanted into the prostatic urethra in a crimp configuration and left there for only five to seven days. Over the five to seven day period, it slowly expands and it exerts pressure at three points at 12, five and seven o'clock. And gradually that expansion and pressure induces ischemic incisions uh, and creates these uh, deep and long longitudinal grooves at the bladder neck and the prostatic urethra, which is also something that's unique to this procedure. It's the only minimally invasive procedure that treats patients with uh, bladder neck uh, obstruction as well as uh, BPH. So Dr. Kello, maybe you can walk us through a little bit about how you um, perform the ITIN procedure in your practice. Thank you. So there's two, you could do this procedure uh, in the office. Uh, you could do the procedure uh, under sedation. Uh, they don't have to be under general anesthetic uh, to do the procedure. Uh, I've done it both ways. I prefer right now to do it, uh, I like to do it in the uh, Woodson sedation. We have a surgery center right across uh, the hallway. So for us, uh, we use a rigid cystoscope. Uh, we'll take a look inside. I usually start with a small scope, make sure everything looks good. I'm verifying. You know, usually we check things beforehand with an ultrasound, perhaps a cystoscopy already as well, to make sure they don't have a true median low. They can have uh, a median protrusion uh, or a high bladder neck. I think the high bladder neck or bladder neck obstruction, it, it works really well. But you really want to make sure there's no median lobe because if you imagine a five and seven o'clock incision, it would actually make the median lobe more pronounced. Um, also, you know, it's one size fits all. Uh, I tend to look for prostates that you know, are 80 grams or less. Uh, but it's, I think, interesting for the patients who have small prostate but obstructive symptoms, maybe they have less of a glandular, more of a stromal component. I think this type of treatment uh, uh, can work well. Anyways, when the device goes, when the scope goes in and I'm ready to deploy, I just ask for the device. You take your lens out, you fish the device through the sheath. You then uh, push in the sheath some, uh, you push the device through where it now deploys. And it's a large stent, it's not a tiny stent. It needs to be kind of large because it's gonna create ischemia over the next five to seven days. You then remove your sheath, reset your scope, go back in alongside the I-10 device, and then you can see it and you gently pull it into position. There's a little leaflet uh, that you wanna anchor right in front of the, you wanna anchor the leaflet where the vero, it's between the vero and the bladder neck. And then you have the 12, five, and seven struts They'll be kind of sticking a little bit into the bladder, which is also what you want. You want that action to occur at the bladder neck. And then you're done. I mean, the procedure takes about, honestly, it can take as little as three to four minutes to do. You just have to be gentle. You don't want to start stirring up bleeding. And then it can be a little bit harder to visualize everything. It just depends on you visualizing where the device is. And you could do this in the office as well. You can use a flexible cystoscope, a ureteral access sheath to deploy the device through. Um, that's to me more steps. So I've done it in the office using some more uh, Valium, laughing gas, uh, using a rigid scope. It's, it's doable, but obviously when you're starting off, I think it's a lot easier for you to start uh, doing this in the uh, in the operating room where you can keep the patient still for those few minutes. That's a really good point. Um, so here you can see on the uh, on the slides here, this is just a, a couple of images showing the positioning of the item device. So on the left you can see that's the anchoring leaflet that's just sitting at the base of the bladder neck. And as Dr. Kello was saying, the end of the strut should be protruding a little bit into the bladder so you get that effect on the bladder neck. Uh, and the other two images are really interesting because this is some MRI images and you can see First of all, the positioning of the I-10 device, but also you can see the size of the I-10 device. So this is the device when it's fully expanded after five to seven days. And you can see that this is really a large device. This isn't a small stent. Uh, and that's why we're able to, uh, to achieve the effect that we're able to achieve. Uh, these are some other pictures. <clears throat> so we've got some before and after. And here you, see, you can see that this is after the device has been removed. And this is what these longitudinal channels look like. And Dr. Kella, I know that you often do still scope your patients after device removal. Is this sort of representative of what you would usually see? So when you, yeah, I like to use the cystoscope to uh, remove the device. We remove it in the, in the office, uh, make sure the patient has some uh, pain medication and maybe a Valium. It's a quick removal, but it can be a, a spicy removal. So make sure the patients are, are adequately uh, 
uh, it have good enough meds for their comfort. But yes, it can look a little bit edematous. Sometimes you don't get a great view of what it looks like, but a lot of times you can see the furrows where it's made the incisions of five, seven, and, and 12. And I don't have, uh, I should collect data to see if the deeper the furrows, the better the, the results. But I just like to, that way it's kind of verified to me that the device has done what it's supposed to do. Um, and like I said, it takes a, about a minute or so to remove the device in the office and then the patient is off. So this is uh, a little bit of an overview of our clinical data. So we have uh, quite a few published clinical studies. We've got uh, a little over 450 patients, uh, publications of a little over the 450 patients um, published in clinical studies, but we have another 100 and some odd patients that are currently uh, uh, under clinical study at the moment. <clears throat> and what we can see here is, first of all, very significant symptomatic relief, similar to what you would see with other minimally invasive technologies. A reduction in IPSS of about 60%, a significant improvement in QMAX. Uh, in one of the studies, we even saw an over 100% improvement in QMAX. But I think that one of the most things that's the most interesting in this data is the speed of the symptomatic relief. Um, so first of all, patients experience symptomatic relief within a couple of weeks, and then the second, I'll ask Dr. Kella, uh, sometimes even faster than that, which is really nice for the patients. Um, and also the other uh, interesting thing, or the also important thing, is the adverse event profile. So first of all, very low rate of adverse events. And adverse events, if they are experienced, they're usually mild and transient, self-resolving, and within a couple of weeks. So within the first 30 days, whatever adverse events were experienced have been resolved. And I think that's another really important thing for patients that are looking for a procedure that's relatively easy and that's going to offer them significant and rapid symptomatic relief uh, and a very easy and, and rapid uh, recovery. Right. I, I would agree that the, the procedure has a, has a fast learning curve and the nice thing is, is there are very few uh, issues afterwards. Um, I mean, I've placed the patients on some antibiotics uh, after the device has been removed. They get an antibiotic and we place the device. Uh, so, you know, you're not gonna have anyone get hospitalized uh, afterwards. Uh, you know, get an occasional patient who may have urinary retention. That's probably the worst uh, thing that I've seen in a place of catheter. Depending on their volume, place a catheter for a few days. So, complication profile is very attractive. Uh, again, I think, uh, Vanessa, as you were saying, the, uh, it, it has uh, the ability to give you the results quickly. Um, you know, the patients don't wear a catheter during this uh, procedure. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't recommend it if they have urinary retention because you do need to keep a catheter in, and so you need to be mindful of that. Although you could use it if that's the patients who wanted to do it even uh, with retention. The procedure also, um, you know, again, it hits us, for me, it hits the spot for a lot of the things that we're looking for as far as the ability to, again, not impact the sexual function, uh, improve urinary function quickly. Uh, the duration, I think we'll get into, into that, but I usually tell patients, look, we have three-year data. Um, this procedure, is it gonna give you a lifetime of relief or your prostate's gonna to continue to grow? Probably not. But you know, with TERP, I've seen that as well. Now that I'm older, a lot of guys are TERP 10 years ago, now they're they're back. And uh, you look in with the scope, you're amazed at uh, you know, the regrowth that you've seen. So I tell them, look, this is a way you can get, get on with your life, uh, minimize, if not eliminate your symptoms, uh, and hopefully for, you know, years, avoid having to come back to, to see me in the office. Thank you. So now we have uh, a couple of uh, case studies. Uh, these were some patients I think that you treated quite some time ago. Um, so maybe you can walk us uh, through these, uh, these patients a little bit. Sure. So a uh, typical patient, 68 year old, healthy. Uh, this patient was concerned about a slow flow, nocturia. Uh, he had tried finasteride and was either having erectile dysfunction or had read about the risk for ED and didn't want to uh, be on the medication. His prostate wasn't severely large, but he had been placed on finasteride. And he had been through Flomax, which was causing retrograde or an ejaculation. And even uh, alfizosin, eroxitrol, wasn't helping him in that regard. So he was looking for a procedure. Uh, we talked about uh, ITIN, he was very uh, interested. We did a cystoscopy and 
He did have some intravesicular protrusion, a medium protrusion, but no low. Uh, his prostate was 40 grams, um, and his bladder was functioning. Um, you just tell he was he had obstruction. So he, we went ahead and did the uh, the I-10 postoperatively. Uh, at that time, I was giving Narco and Viridium. I still will give, uh, depending on how uh, I can kind of gauge what the patient's going to need. Usually, I'll give them either Dorgo afterwards. Or sometimes I'll still give them Tylenol 3 or, or, or Norco. Um, he, uh, they will com complain. I, yeah, I advise them beforehand, look, you're going to have pressure. It makes sense. This is a large stent, and it's exerting pressure in your pelvis. So expect that, and here are some medications that are going to help you get through these five to seven days. You should be able to urinate afterwards, but you may have some more frequency or urgency while the device is in place. Then. Um, uh, so he did complain of the pressure and frequency, um, did a little bit of, yeah, overnight he had bloody urine. That's also something you want to counsel the patients, it can be a little bit, uh, should be mostly clear, but you'll see some tinges of blood. Um, I did give him oxybutynin and he was fine. We then had him uh, come back to remove the device. And then afterwards, uh, you can see here uh, his IPSS scores uh, improved quite a bit is from 20 and 4 for quality of life to 12 and 2 at 4 weeks and then to 6 and 1 so he's very happy with his quality of life at, at 6 weeks uh, and slow flow was better and arterial was much better uh, this was 8 months post procedure now we're uh, at 3 years actually for these uh, two cases he's still doing uh, fine he has uh, had an annual follow up and hasn't been he's not on any medications uh, and he's not complaining as of yet I think we have one more case. This is our second case, um, similar, a healthy male, uh, mostly bothered by slow flow. Same thing, finasteride. Uh, his prostate was too small for finasteride anyways, but he was on finasteride. Uh, he was on taking Cordura and Alfuzosin. Uh, Cialis wasn't, uh, was giving him pal uh, palpitations. He had a small prostate, 25 grams, and a, what looked like a high uh, bladder neck or a medium bar. Uh, he underwent I tend postoperatively. I gave him toradol, peridium. Um, I gave him some macrobid postop. Now I just give antibiotics on the day of the procedure. Uh, he actually didn't have too many complaints afterwards. And then you can see here with his IPSS scores, uh, 13 and 3 pre, it moved to 9 and 0. So no complaints on quality of life. Uh, and that was four weeks later off medications and happy at six weeks um, no impact on his ejaculatory function uh, I don't I have not seen him in follow-up recently but uh, I'm hoping that means that's a good thing so those are a couple of the cases kind of representative cases that I've seen with ITIM thank you um, so that's really all that we had to present today but we wanted to make sure uh, to leave some time left for any questions uh, from the audience and also, we're very lucky uh, to have here today Mr. Idoki Lemnik, uh, who's the inventor of ITIN and the founder of Meditate. Um, so if anyone has any more technical questions about the development of the device or how it works, uh, then Ido is also here uh, to answer questions. So. I'm worried about the aesthetic injury by the uh, dislocation of the device. So the question I think was, uh, there's worry about impact on the sphincter by the location of the device. So the device needs to be placed, you, you should not be placing the device at the sphincter. So it has a leaflet that keeps it in place. So it can't slip and get into the sphincter. In those studies, no one's, you, you'd imagine if someone, if the device is in the sphincter, they would have uh, significant incontinence afterwards. That's not something that was really reported in the data nor in my experience. So I'm very confident on the incontinence uh, or risk to the sphincter. Do you have several slides of the ITIN according to the length of the Do we have slides of the ITIN doing what? Yeah. Size. Size. Yeah. Do you have several slides? There's one size. Only one size. One size fits all. I believe the instructions for use uh, 80 grams is the limit, I believe, for uh, the ITIN. Very positive. Other questions?
Could you just um, speak a little bit more about removing it, retrieval after five days? You said it's a little spicy. Find <laughs> that a little bit better. Yeah, Is that so something you're doing in the office? I do it in the office. So the device removal, um, I tell the patient, okay, we're going to give you some. I usually give them uh, Xana, Alprazolam, or, or Valium. Um, I'll give them also some Toril. And then usually we'll insert some lidocaine jelly into the urethra and let that sit for a few minutes. Uh, the patients have an option to do laughing gas nitrous as well during the removal. And then when I come in, the first, now I know just to make it quick. Um, and so what I'll do is uh, there is a catheter that Coloplast makes that you can use. It's, a, it's an open ended Foley catheter. There's not a Foley, there's no balloon, but it's an open ended catheter. And you can, oh, well, there is a balloon on it, but it's just got a big flat open end to it. And you bring that in, and then you can feel it kind of engage the device, and then you just pull. That's one way to do it. I go in with a scope look, and then I can place that catheter in and, and pull. So I'm doing a little bit extra, which is probably not necessary. So you use a rigid scope when you're doing it? When I place it in the OR, I'm using a rigid scope. When I've done it in the office, I've used a rigid scope, but I mostly do it with the patient sedated in the OR. Retrieval, there's no IV, it's in the office, and I, I remove it. Um, I think it, you could offer it. You had mentioned that you, you sometimes scope them with retrieval. With a flexible scope. Right. And the, the catheter is all part of the... Um, so the catheter is not part of the kit right now, but the reps, they've provided our office with the, with the device. We're, getting, we're sourcing it. Thank you. We're going to be having a, a dedicated removal kit to, that includes everything that you need in coming out in the next couple of months, so just for convenience. Any other questions? Can you talk just briefly about the five to seven days that these patients have that in there and how you're nursing them through that discomfort? I mean, is it just anti-inflammatories and anti-monarchs? So, it's like any sort of procedure, uh, you have a large variation in, uh, you know, when, I, when the patients come back, uh, they've been on uh, Toral. I have, currently I'll have them uh, take uh, Toral. Um, I'll have them continue if they're on BPH meds. I'll tell them just go ahead and continue your BPH meds right now and I'll have you stop your BPH meds a few weeks after the device has been removed because that five to seven days the device is in, they should be, I tell them you should be having a lot of pressure in your pelvis. You're gonna be able to function, you're gonna be able to walk, uh, get around, take care of things you need to do. You're not gonna be laid up, you know, lying down, trying to recover from this procedure. But I want you to take the anti-inflammatories. Um, I usually give them 12 to 20 uh, Pitorolac uh, pills, and then I'll give them a supply. If they have more intense pain, especially at the beginning, um, I'll give them either Tylenol-3 or, or some Norco. Uh, medication and that no one you know up to this point uh, not, we've probably done I'm not sure 40 50 cases and no one has come in saying you know demanding that the device be removed early uh, so we've been able to kind of nurse everyone through this period of time and I haven't really gotten any um, uh, you know after so five days it seems to have gotten better by the time they're in the office um, not completely gone, but usually that first, the first 24 to 72 hours is where I tell them to expect the most intense discomfort. I think that's a really uh, good question, and I think that uh, one of the things, at least my experience with the ITIN, is that the learning curve for actually performing the procedure is very short. It's not a complicated procedure to perform. Uh, but I think that one of the things that maybe sometimes is underappreciated is there's actually a learning curve for managing those patients during the five to seven days. So are there any tips or any sort of things that you've learned as you've you know, uh, gained more experience about how to counsel your patients, how to manage expectations that's really helped uh, improve their experience? I think we all have a, uh, a radar as urologists. When a patient comes in for consultation, you can kind of tell, for the most part, how certain people are going to respond. And so that sometimes goes into my, you know, leading that one way or the other. You know, if someone comes in and they're a complete nervous Nelly, you know, I might tell them, hey, medications are great, continue your medication. <laughs> but, um, you know, usually patients have done research and we've talked about all the different procedures we offer on our website and a lot of people come in intently, hey, I really want to learn, 
I a candidate for, for this, or am I a candidate for ITIN? And uh, those are motivated patients who actually probably know. And then for the ones who don't know or aren't completely aware, we'll go through it. So just in that extra few minutes of preoperative counseling and then reminding them, sometimes they you know, don't hear the first time, tell them again right before the surgery, and then you know, when the device is, um, when they're ready, when they're coming for the device removal, they're like, man, yeah, you were right. It was, there was a lot of pressure, but it was fine. I made it through, I took the medications like you told me to. So uh, if you don't tell them anything, then you're gonna be, just like with any procedure, you're gonna be uh, getting a lot of uh, upset phone calls. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, and uh, if anyone has any other questions later, then uh, we'll be over at the Olympus booth, and uh, please feel free to come by and uh, learn a little bit more about ITIN. Thank you.